I know I'm supposed to give uh, sort of a, a story or a funny kind of joke to win over the audience, but in the interest of time, we're going to skip that and just sort of jump into the meat of our material only because we only have about 50 minutes of time. And normally, Oregon Right to Life has me produce and teach this information over a period of eight hours. So we're compressing it slightly into about 50 minutes. So uh, we're just going to jump right in. How about that? Okay. And we'll worry about liking me later, if you like me at all. Okay. Now, you probably know uh, there is a lot of talk about social justice, social justice, even in Christian circles these days, very much so. And under that heading, people often talk about uh, human trafficking, uh, poverty, homelessness, all sorts of different topics that would fall under that heading. Now, I'm not here to in any way suggest that those are not important subjects that we need to care about as believers, if you're a Christian. And again, I'm, um, I'm assuming that many of you are, uh, are Christians. If you're not, that's totally fine. But just so you know, that's kind of the audience that I'm primarily speaking to. But uh, obviously, as Christians, we need to be concerned about these things. In fact, for that matter, even any human being should be concerned about the social ills and the, and the evils that occur in our, in our culture. So I'm not trying to downplay any of that. However, what's conspicuously absent oftentimes in social justice conferences is the very topic of abortion. And what's odd about that is that if it's true, if what we believe about abortion is true, and that is that, it, that abortion kills an innocent human being, then abortion rises to become the most important and significant social justice issue of our day. Why? Because abortion is legal in all 50 states throughout all nine months of pregnancy and for virtually any reason. And according to Planned Parenthood's own statistics, about 3,500 unborn children are killed each day. Now, there's about 2,900 or so people who were killed in 9-11, but 3,500 die each day in abortion, and that's significant. Now, last time I checked, it's not legal to force people into poverty. Last time I checked, it's not legal to uh, take people's homes and make them homeless. Last time I checked, it's not legal to traffic human beings and force them into slaver, slavery or into sex. However, it is legal to kill innocent human beings through abortion. In fact, not only is it legal, but we support it through our federal government and pay with it uh, by our taxes. And that is why I am arguing that social justice issues, of all the ones that are around, abortion becomes the most critical one of those. Now that's certainly upsetting, but for me what even is more upsetting is that approximately 27% of people who identify themselves as having abortions, or who have abortions, identify themselves as being Catholic. 33% say that they are Protestant. That means Christians are killing their own children. So the most, uh, most dangerous place for a baby to be in America today is resting in her own mother's womb. And so I want to talk to you this morning about how we can make that place safer for unborn children by making abortion unthinkable. Now, you might be thinking, Alan, come on, that's ridiculous. This is abortion. People don't change their minds on abortion. People are too entrenched on one side or the other. You can't change people's minds. I think that is absolutely false. In fact, I know it's false because we see people change their minds all the time, sometimes in just a matter of minutes. The key is to use the right tactics, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, is three tasks that will help you to make abortion unthinkable in your spheres of influence. And if you have a handout, you'll see I've, I've broken down the, the handout into three sections, three different tasks, and we're going to take each one in turn. So here is the first task that you have as a pro-life advocate to try to make abortion unthinkable, and that is simply to show that there is actually only one question to resolve in the entire abortion debate. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. You see, most times when you're in a conversation, you rarely end up talking about abortion itself. Instead, what often happens is the conversation naturally tangents off onto all sorts of peripheral issues, like choice and privacy, or back alley abortions, or rape and incest, or unwantedness. And if you're like most normal people, you're probably thinking to yourself, man, I can't be effective in the pro-life issue. How can I possibly know everything there is to know about all these issues? How can I know about back alley abortions and the incidents that that happens? Or how can I know about adoption rates and, and pregnancy and rape and all these things? I mean, that's just overwhelming. It's such a complex issue, this abortion. How can I possibly be effective? And while though I would agree that abortion perhaps might be emotionally complex, morally, 
it is a very simple issue. You don't have to know all this stuff. In fact, you have to only really know how to resolve one question. And that one question is, what is the unborn? And I'd argue that this key question resolves the entire abortion debate when you're having a conversation with somebody about the issue. Now, don't freak out when I use the word debate. I just simply mean in conversation that you're having with people who might disagree with you. Let me give you an illustration as to how I know this is the key issue. Imagine one evening you're uh, at your computer or maybe you're washing the dishes, either way, and imagine you have a seven-year-old son, which I, by the way, have a seven-year-old son, or for those of you who are younger, imagine you have a seven-year-old brother. And while you're working, he comes up behind you, and while your back is still turned, you hear him ask you a question. And he says, can I kill this? Now, before you can answer that question, what question are you going to ask him? Yeah, what is it? Now, imagine you turn around, and that little boy is holding a daddy long leg spider with his fingers. What's your answer going to be? Yes. Go ahead, kill it, you know? You take one leg, I'll take another leg, let's pull that sucker and cook, right? Now, what if he's holding the neighbor's cat? What's your answer going to be? No. Unless you're a dog lover, in which case, it, no, I'm sorry. no, I'm kidding. Yeah, you're like, okay, well, maybe not. Now, what if he's holding his little sister by the neck? What's your answer going to be? No, he needs counseling, right? You know, take him ASAP right now to the counselor for therapy. But notice what this illustration points out. Whether or not it's moral to kill something depends entirely upon what it is we're killing. You can't answer the question, can I kill this, until you first answer the question, what is it? And so here is a key principle that I want you to, to really put to memory regarding this key question. If you ask the question, what is the unborn, and through your analysis, it turns out that the unborn is not a human being, then no justification for abortion is necessary. If, however, on the other hand, it turns out that the unborn is a human being, then no justification for abortion is adequate. Right? Think about that for a moment. If the unborn is not a human being, go ahead, have the abortion. What's the big deal? If it's no different than having your tooth pulled or your appendix taken out, or your tonsils removed, then go ahead and have the abortion. You don't have to give uh, evidences or, or defenses from rape and incest and unwantedness and choice and privacy. That's irrelevant. Have the abortion. Who cares? But if it turns out the unborn is a human being, then there's no justification for killing an innocent human being, at least for the reasons that people give for having abortions. And that's why the question, the key question, what is the unborn, is the key question. Now, oftentimes, in fact, most times that we see people on the street defending abortion, they offer defenses that completely sidestep that question. In fact, not only do they sidestep the question, what is the unborn? In their defense for abortion, they're assuming the unborn is not a human being. You know, women have a right to choose, or women have a right to privacy, or many poor women can't afford another child. All of these defenses for abortion don't ask the question or answer it. They simply assume the unborn is not a human being. And so what we have to do then in these popular defenses that we see for abortion is turn the conversation away from these issues, because if you follow these, these, what I would say, peripheral issues, you'll never end up talking about abortion. Oh, sure, you'll talk about privacy and choice and rape and incest for months and years, perhaps, with your relative. And you might be thinking, man, People don't change their minds on abortion. That's right, because you're not talking about abortion. You're talking about choice, privacy, unwantedness, or other things. These are not what's at stake. The issue is abortion. And so I want to teach you a tactic that'll help you bring the conversation back away from these peripheral issues, back to the key question, what is the unborn? And that tactic is called trot out the toddler. And here's how the tactic basically functions from kind of a bird's eye view. What it does is it takes all of these tangential issues like rape, choice, privacy, uh, back alley abortions, economic hardship, and it sort of funnels these different topics back to the one key question, which is what? What is the unborn? Okay, which is the key question. So let me show you how this tactic works. There's three steps to it, and don't worry if you don't understand the steps, but we'll go through a few examples. The first step is to listen to their defense for abortion. In other words, just think, okay, what one word or, or phrase captures their reasoning for abortion. And then here's the, key play, here's the key part. Ask 
if it's permissible to kill a toddler, say a three or a two year old, for that same reason they just offered for abortion. Now most people are going to say, no, of course you can't kill a toddler for whatever that reason was. And so that will point out that really the real issue is not the reason they just gave for abortion, but rather the key question is what is the unborn? Now let me give you some examples in case you're not following what's going on here. So people will say, or most offenses for abortion will sound something like this perhaps. They'll say, well, women have a right to privacy. Now what's the one word or two words that captures the defense for abortion here? Right to privacy, exactly. So now here's the second step in the trot of the toddler. Ask a question that uses that defense for abortion to justify killing a toddler. So when people say this to me, I ask this, well, do we allow a mother to kill her two-year-old or three-year-old as long as she does it in the privacy of her own home? <laughs> now, what is every abortion choice advocate going to say to this question? Of course not. What are you silly pro-lifers? What, you guys are not, you guys are full of foolish. Of course you can't kill a, a two-year-old just because you do it in the privacy of, of your own home. And I'd say, well, well, why not? They say, because it's a human being. The, the unborn's not a human being. The two-year-old obviously is. Oh, I see. That's the key difference. You think the unborn's not a human being. I think the unborn is just like the two-year-old. So really, the question isn't privacy. The question is, what is the unborn? You see, because if the unborn is just like that toddler, then you can't kill the unborn for the reason of privacy for the same reason you can't kill a toddler for the reason of, of privacy. Let's take a look at another one. Many poor women can't afford another child. Again, a common defense for abortion, at least one on the street. Now, again, what's the one or two word defense for abortion in this case? Can't afford it, financial hardship, economics, okay? So now, what question could we ask that uses that same justification to kill a toddler? Can anybody think of a question? Can we help a poor person by killing one of the toddlers she already has? Okay, yeah, can we help a poor person by killing one of the toddlers they already have? Okay, so yeah, that, that's a perfect one. I just happen to say, is it right for a mother to kill her two-year-old because he's too expensive to care for? Okay, and you know, I trust me. I, I mean, I don't. I'm not in poverty, but look, I have I have a boy. This guy goes through like a bowl of cereal every five minutes. <laughs> so you know, a cashy heart-to-heart -heart cereal, those things. You know, the kind of the natural cereals. It's like four or five bucks a box. I mean, that's like in one week he'll go through three or four boxes. You know, so I get it. Now again, I'm not poverty stricken, but I get kids are expensive. Okay. So now, obviously, if you ask this question, what is every abortion choice advocate going to say to this question? No, no you crazy poor lifers, what are you guys messed up in the brain? Of course not. You can't kill a two-year-old just because they're too expensive. Oh, okay, well, well, why not? Well, because that's different. The two-year-old's an obviously a human being. The unborn is not. Oh, okay, so that's the difference. You think the unborn is not a human being. I think that they are. So that's, let's, let's talk about that question. Are they just like the two-year-old? You know? So you see how every question that they, or every defense that they bring up can be brought back to this key question, what is the unborn? That's what you want to talk about. You don't want to talk about financial hardship. Because you'll talk about it for days, weeks, months, and you'll think, man, I'm a great pro-life warrior. No, you're not. I don't mean, I'm not here to be rude. I'm just trying to be honest. You can talk all about it all forever, but it won't matter unless you're talking about abortion. We'll do one more example. A child with Down syndrome or whatever other disease you want to put in there shouldn't have to suffer. Again, what's the defense you're giving for abortion? Suffering, disease, disability, whatever it might be. Okay, so what one question can we use that trots out the toddler that uses that same defense for killing a toddler? Yeah, if I had a five-year-old child up here who had Down syndrome, would it be justified for me to kill this five-year-old because they have Down syndrome? And every abortion choice advocate will say, no, of course not, you're crazy, you pro-lifers. Doesn't make any sense. That's, not, that's totally different. This five-year-old's a human being, the unborn's not. Ah, uh, okay, well that's the real issue. Is the unborn a human being just like the five-year-old? Do you see how every defense for abortion can, can be brought back to this one key question, what is the unborn? Now, I'll give you one more and then we'll, we'll move on to the next task. But I wanna mention this issue of rape because it's one of the hard cases whenever I'm debating abortion, I get probably five questions from the audience just on this one challenge. And uh, before I show you how you can trot out the toddler even with this, let me first show you a video uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a campus, a secular university campus, where we are having a debate about abortion. And in one part of the, the grass area, a woman who was raped, who had gotten pregnant and who had an abortion, 
was defending herself amidst of a crowd of pro-lifers who had surrounded her. And I want you to just watch the conversation unfold, and I'm going to make some comments about it. I'm sure you do. I'm sure, and I don't like it. And then maybe you would feel worse if I was screaming in childbirth, if I was a mother who never had the um, ability to go to college, if I was homeless with this kid, or no money, no way of supporting it. Maybe if I was in a more hopeless situation, you could actually see and understand I made the choice for a reason. Wait for now, I shouldn't have to, to discuss this with you some more. I shouldn't have to hit rock bottom for someone else to say, oh well, I guess the other choice was better. But do you see that you're basing your whole argument on the fact that you were 13 and that you were raped and you got pregnant? Yes, I'm what basing the argument on the exception to the rule. Right. There is an exception right. to the rule, which means you cannot say abortion is illegal okay. because someone's gonna need that. Okay. Someone's gonna have to have that in their lives to make their lives worth living. So do you what about abortion in the cases of not, of not being raped or a woman who's 22? Again, again, she's making that choice for a reason. She has that reasoning ability within her. This conversation went on for about 45 minutes where different pro-lifers were responding to this woman who had had an abortion, I'm sorry, because she was, because she was raped and got pregnant. Now, not once in this conversation did anybody stop and say to her, I'm sorry that you were raped. I'm sorry that you had perhaps one of the most vile things that could possibly happen to a human being occur to you. You see, oftentimes when the issue of rape comes up, it's not a test to see if you as a pro-lifer have a logical response. It's a test to see if you as a pro-lifer has a heart. And oftentimes, I'm here to say, unfortunately, we fail that test. Because we come off as these logical robots that just wants to give a, an answer to any defense for abortion. Look, don't get me wrong, the logic is on our side, the science is on our side, the philosophy is on our side, but we got to show that we care about people, especially if they bring up the issue of rape. And this is one of the areas that we really have dropped the ball, and we got to just stop and say, man, I am so sorry this happened to you, and recognize that we're talking about or talking to a human being who's been violated in a really serious way and perhaps is hurting from it. So yes, we can try to the toddler, yes, we can respond to it, but just make sure that before you do, especially if you're talking to a female, obviously if you're talking to a man, most likely he was not raped and got pregnant, but if you're talking to a female, there's a good chance that that may have happened. And so you just want to be sensitive to that and just come across as, look, I acknowledge that this is bad and this is an evil and this is, this is tough, right? So do that, all right? So I will try to the toddler here, but just realize that we got to make sure we make this point first to show that we care as well. Now, having said that, we can still try to the toddler with that. Rape really isn't the issue of what's going on here at abortion. Okay? Now, going with the trot of the toddler, the defense that's being offered here is rape. But what trot out the toddler question could we ask that demonstrates that rape is not a defense for abortion? And that, the, and that really the question is, what is the unborn? What, key, what trot out the toddler question would work? Again, just apply the same steps that we applied in the other questions. Yes, sir. My child was uh, two years old right now. It was conceived by rape, and I'd go ahead and kill them. Yes, yes. So if I had a child here who was conceived in rape, who's now two years old, could we kill this child? And again, what is every abortion choice advocate going to say to this question? No, of course not. That's different, though. How is it different? That's clearly a human being that you have here up on stage, and the unborn, it's different. Okay, so the key question then is not, was she raped or was she conceived in rape? The key question then is, what is the unborn? Because if the unborn is just like this two-year-old, and you can't kill the two-year-old because they were conceived through rape for the same reason, you can't kill then the unborn as well. Do you see how every issue comes back to that key question, what is the unborn? Unless you go off on that tangent and spend your weeks and years talking about rape. Now, just because rape is a big deal, let me just offer you another way to respond or the way I respond to this question. I imagine, I suggest, imagine the hypothetical situation. Imagine we catch the rapist, okay? Do we allow the mother to shoot and kill the rapist? Some of you are saying, yeah, maybe we should, you know. <laughs> but we don't, okay? But here's the point. If we don't allow the mother to kill the rapist who is guilty, why she should she be allowed to kill a child who is innocent? Why should the child pay for the crime of his or her father? 
If anybody deserves to be killed, it's the guilty party, the rapist, not the innocent one. I'm not saying we should kill rapists. I'm just simply saying, if anybody deserves punishment, it's the guilty party, not the innocent party. And yet when we allow for abortion in the instance of rape, we are saying, let's punish the one who is innocent right, rather than the one who's guilty. And that makes no sense. And if you think about it, there's no other situation where after you have been victimized yourself, can you then turn around and victimize a completely another innocent person? I mean, if somebody keys your car with, you know, scratches to put a huge gouge in your car with their key, can you be like, oh man, go find some other car and just like key that thing as well? It's like, no, you can't do that. You're not justified in, you know, victimizing somebody else just because you've been victimized. So anyways, again, from, from this perspective, it doesn't make sense to suggest that rape should be allowed in the case, I'm sorry, abortion should be allowed in the case of rape. So that's the first task, is to show there's only one question to resolve. Now the, key que now the key task is to answer that question, what is the unborn, by demonstrating that the unborn is a human being from the moment of conception. And uh, so this is the second task, to show that the unborn is a human being. Now, I know you could probably make biblical arguments for that if you happen to be a Christian or if you consider the Bible to be an authority, but let me just tell you, most people in our culture now do not think the, that the Bible is a source of authority. And so you have to appeal to other sources of authority that the culture considers to be relevant and authoritative. And for a lot of people, I hate to say it, science is king. And so I simply appeal to the science of embryology, which I would argue proves, and by the way, I don't use the term proves very often. I mean, I think there's reasons to think that God exists. I think there's reasons to think that we have an immaterial soul. I don't think you can prove it conclusively. But on the case of embryology, it really does prove the unborn is a human being in, this, in that strong sense of the word. And here's how we can show that. If you can show these three things, the unborn is a living being, meaning it's alive. Two, that it's a distinct individual, meaning not part of the mother's body, or not, it's unique and different from the mother. And three, that it's a human type of being, not a dog or a Venus flytrap or an earwig or something else. Okay? And so if... If you can show these three parts are true of the unborn, then I would believe that you can successfully show that the unborn is a human being. So let's take each one in turn. The first one's perhaps the most straightforward and uh, easy to kind of make the case that the unborn is a living being. Um, this can be shown from a, different, a number of different lines of evidence. The first you could say, look, there's no period of non-life. You got two living gametes, sperm and egg, they come together, they form this thing, we call it a zygote, you know, whatever. These are all living entities. So there's no period of non-life anywhere that exists. Furthermore, the unborn is growing. And things that grow tend to be alive. It's not conclusive, but they tend to be alive, right? In fact, all that the unborn needs to do to grow is exactly the same things that you and I need to grow. And that is nutrition and proper environment. You give the unborn to nutrition and proper environment, and just like you, it will grow and survive just fine. And the third thing is that the unborn meets the biological criteria for life. Biologists, when they're studying something and they want to know, is this thing alive? They ask three questions. Does it grow? Does it respond to stimuli? And does it metabolize nutrients and convert it to energy? If it does those three things, it's alive. Grows, responds to stimuli, and metabolizes nutrients and converts it to energy. And those are the things that the, the biologist typically will say, yeah, this thing must be alive then if it does those three things. The unborn does those three things. Therefore, the unborn is a living being. But now you might be thinking, okay, it's a living being, but is it alive like the mother's appendix is alive? Or is it alive like her, the mother's uh, tonsils are alive, living tissue? Or is it a unique individual? Well, again, I believe that the science of embryology is decisive on this question. In fact, what are some ways, you guys can perhaps tell me, that the unborn differs from the mother that gives us a clue or evidence that the unborn is a unique individual? Yes, sir? Blood type. Blood type. That's right. The unborn could have a different blood type than the mother. In fact, uh, the unborn has a different heart, has a different circulatory system. It, it, yeah, yeah, hold on. <laughs> can you, let me just wait, wait, one more point. <laughs> I'm just, yes, sir? That's right. So, so just going back to the blood type thing, let me just address one interesting point about this. In embryology, the mother's blood and the unborn's blood comes very, very close, but it does not mix. 
and it comes close so there can be transfer of nutrients and waste, but it doesn't mix. Now, if there was a problem in embryological development where the blood was to mix and the mother's blood got mixed up with the, with the unborn's blood, here's what would happen. The mother's body would mount immune, an immune response against the unborn. Why? Because it perceives the unborn's body as a foreign entity. The mother's immune system does not attack her appendix or her tonsils or her molars because they're a part of her body. If the unborn was merely a part of her body in that same way, the mother's body would not mount an immune response against it in the event of a, of a mix-up like that. And that is clear testimony that even her own body physiologically perceives it to be a foreign person in there. So good, what else? I heard you, yes ma'am, what were you saying? What was your example? That's right. The unborn could be a different gender. In fact, uh, one of my friends was at a party many years ago. It was kind of one of those Hollywood parties. We live in Southern California. But he was at this party, and he was talking to a woman who was pregnant who happened to be an animal rights activist. And she says she really believes in you know, caring for life. And he said, well, you must be pro-life on the issue of abortion. And she said, well, you would think I would be, but actually I'm not. When it comes to abortion, I think, you know, since it's my body, it's my choice. So he asked her, he said, can I ask you a personal question? She said, sure, of course you can. He said, do you have a penis? She's all, um, no, I don't. She said, and he said, well, could your unborn child have a penis? She said, yeah. He said, then your unborn cannot be part of your body. Otherwise, you have a penis. She thought to herself, now, I don't recommend you use that at every party you go to, you know, but it worked in that instance, okay? So I'll just, for the record. So yeah, absolutely, good. What else? What else is different? I heard DNA. Is somebody? Yeah, DNA. So certainly in forensics, we always look at DNA to determine whether this is one person or another person, and DNA would be an unmistakable piece of evidence that shows the unborn has a different DNA than both the mother or the father, for that matter. So we can go through, you know, fingerprints are different, and again, different... You know, everybody has different fingerprints. The, ge the genetic fingerprints, of course, are different. We mentioned that. Different blood type, different brain and central nervous system, different gender, we've mentioned that. Furthermore, think about this. You can conceive of a human being being conceived in a Petri dish outside of the mother's body and then later implanted inside the mother's body, which is further evidence that the unborn is not simply part of her body. And for that matter, you could probably also conceive, in the case of a surrogate parenthood, that a Chinese mother could be carrying a Swedish child with a completely different race than her than the mother's, which is, again, further evidence that we're not talking about part of her body, but rather another person that resides within her body in a very unique way, obviously. So clearly the unborn is a different being than the... Um, yeah, so the, the unborn is a unique individual being from the mother's body. Okay, It's alive, it's different from the mother in the sense that it's a unique individual. But now the question becomes, what kind of unique and uh, living thing is it? Is it a dog being? Is it a, uh, a tiger being? Is it an a earwig or a spider or a silverfish? I'm, notice I'm, notice, I'm, I'm suggesting all these like... Uh, pests that are in my house because they're constantly in my mind every time I go, like all these silverfish are, you know. What kind of being is it? And if you think about it, this is, a, again, a biological question. If you study the um, discipline of taxonomy, which is where we identify every living thing as something, right? Everything that's alive is something and not just nothing. And so when it comes to the question of taxonomy with regard to the unborn, we can also ask the question, what kind of being is it? Now, there's two ways to figure this question out. The first is, is a difficult way, and that is to simply look at its genetic signature. And so if you were to get some sort of a DNA testing kit, perhaps there's one at Target these days, I don't know. Maybe there's coupons two for one, I'm not sure. But if you had access to such a thing, you could perhaps look at four different uh, embryos, living things at the very earliest stages of their life. And simply by looking at them through a microscope, you wouldn't be able to tell what kinds of beings these things are. But if you were to test their DNA, the answer would be decisive. And it could be the case that this living thing is a fish, and this one a bird, and this one a turtle, and this one a human. Because again, the DNA is decisive on the question of what kind of being it is. And if you were to test the unborn, it turns out in every case, it's a human being. 
But again, as I said, most of us don't have access to that, so we probably need a more practical way to figure out what kind of being we're talking about. And this is where Louis Pasteur's idea of biogenesis comes into play. And back in the 19th century, he uh, helped kind of establish this idea that living things reproduce after their own kind. Meaning, if you have two tigers and they come together and mate, what are they going to produce? Another what? Tiger. You get two dogs, they come together and mate, they're going to produce another dog. That's right. And so, you know, when my wife and I were pregnant, you know, we wondered whether we we're going to have a boy or a girl or not, but we didn't wonder whether we we're going to have a, a human or not, right? It was like, <laughs> We're kind of thinking, all right, biogenesis, I'm human, you're human, you know, we're going to have a human being, you know. And so this presents a very simple and practical test. If you want to know what kind of being something is, just simply ask, what are its parents? And if the unborn's parents are human, I'm telling you, the unborn's going to be also human, okay? In fact, when we had our second child, and our second child also turned out to be human, it wasn't like we were surprised by that. Like, oh, wow, two humans in a row, what are the chances, you know? <laughs> It's like, we knew that's what was going to happen, okay? So anyway, so this is, again, a more practical way of figuring out what kind of being the thing is. And by the way, um, I want to show you a little video that helps to confirm with your eyes what your mind has already learned, and that is that the unborn is a human being. Now, this is kind of like an ultrasound, but I would say a little bit more powerful in the sense that this is a video that people have taken and put actually inside the amniotic sac to look at what a developing, unborn human being looks like at just nine weeks development. So let's take a look at this video, and I think this will help confirm what we've already intellectually established, and that is the unborn is a human being. Now, I'm not saying that simply because this thing looks like you and I, that therefore that's what makes it human. I'm just simply saying, look, this is just additional reasons to think that it is. Uh, there are ways that we can respond to the argument that, well, the embryo doesn't look like a human, so what do we do with that? If you want in the q and I'd be happy to answer that question. But I think we've shown then that the three components that we've learned from embryology, namely that the unborn is alive, distinct from its mother, and a human being, that therefore we've concluded that it's a human being just like you and me. And all this occurs from the moment of conception. And so therefore it's reasonable to draw this conclusion that the unborn is a human being. Now standard embryology textbooks in college acknowledge this. Uh, here's one that says that the zygote formed from the union of, a, of an oocyte, which is an egg, and a sperm, is the beginning of a new human being. Uh, human embryology and teratology, another uh, textbook says that a new genetically distinct human organism is formed when the chromosomes of the male and female pronuclei blend in the oocyte. Even David Boonin, who's probably one of the top defenders of abortion in America today, who's a philosopher in Colorado, agrees. He says, look, a human being, I'm sorry, a human fetus after all, is simply a human being at the very early stage of his or her development. And even Peter Singer, who is a, the father of, abor of animal rights, and perhaps one of the greatest defenders of abortion in our world today. Uh, he not only thinks that abortion is permissible, he thinks it's permissible to kill born children for up to four weeks after birth if it turns out that they have a disability and it would bring more happiness to the parents if they were to kill that infant that's already born and then have another kid that doesn't have the disability. Now, I'm not exaggerating his view. That really is his view. And he's not some no-name philosopher working in the basement of a no-name university. He chairs the Department of Philosophy at Princeton University. This guy's a player. 
But even he says, look, there's no doubt that from the first moments of his existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and egg is a human being. So again, I don't think there's any evidence, scientifically speaking, to suggest that the unborn is anything other than a human being. Now, how many of you know who Kathy Ireland is? Raise your hand. So, okay, most of you, uh, you probably also know that she's a pro-life person as well. And many years ago, she came to us where I work at Stand to Reason and asked to get trained on how to defend the full humanity of the unborn from the moment of conception because she was going to go on a television show called Hannity and Combs. <laughs> this is an old Fox TV show where you have uh, Sean Hannity on the left or on the screen. Right, well, I mean, on the yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> on the screen, he's on the left. But yeah, he's on the right, uh, politically speaking. And then Alan Combs, who's on the left, but he'll be on the right of the screen. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so I, so we trained her in the very exact same material I just taught you about. And this is the material I use when I do formal debates with professors and, and feminists around the country, okay? So this is the same material. We taught her the same stuff and had her go on, Hannity and Combs, to talk to, uh, talk about this issue because she had just produced a book and one of the chapters deals with this issue. So I want to show you a quick video clip of her on the show and how she uses material uh, in this particular setting. Us now, Kathy Ireland, author of the new book, Powerful Inspirations, Eight Lessons That Will Change Your Life. Kathy, welcome to Hannity Combs. What do you think about doing a political show like this? Oh, right. I think it's great. I love you guys. Thank you for having me. Did you watch our show? It's great. I do. Gee, I wonder which side you agree with. Now, I, I'm guessing oh. you're you're pretty conservative, but you were telling me off the air you have a very strong liberal position. You know, I, I don't like labels. They cause us to, to dismiss one another, assuming we know all there is to know. I'm conservative on some issues, and I'm liberal on liberal? some issues. Where are you liberal? I'm very very liberal when it comes to protecting the human rights of the unborn. All right, now, you see, I'm very conservative. I'm very conservative. I feel the government has no place in having anything to say about what women do with their bodies concerning it. So is I've got it, the conservative is it her position body? on that. Is it her? I, I didn't want yes. to be pro-choice. But when you ask powerful questions, you get powerful answers. That's one of the chapters in the book, yeah, Powerful yeah. Answers. Right. And the evidence I see tells me that the unborn is a human being. If you can show me any evidence that the unborn is not yes, a human when, being. When is it become, we're not going to settle this here tonight, I don't think. But oh. we, you know, I mean, is it a conception? Is that what it happened? At the moment yes. of conception, at the moment uh, of at conception, a new life comes into being with not... a complete genetic blueprint. The fingerprint is determined. The blood type is determined. The sex is determined. So you would, what kind of life going, is it? You would deny, According to you the law of biogenesis, women, you would deny women the right to then choose what to do at that point. I will always fight for women's rights. I have been an, an activist in women's rights, and I will continue to be. But she doesn't have the right to choose what to do with her body. It's not her body. The baby this woman is carrying could very well have a different blood type than her. If it's a male child, the baby has a well, penis. The woman doesn't have a penis, so it's not a part of her body, but it I, resides I within her body. This issue. We're not gonna, people are not going to come to agreement on this all of a sudden. Take very nice of issue. And I'm sad that it's However, let me ask issue. you. So, there, so there's Kathy uh, doing her thing there, and you know she even did the penis joke, you know, for that matter. So on national television, go for it. Now, obviously, you know, this is, that was a very heated kind of discussion where, you know, on TV, you have to talk over one another to make good TV, I guess. But um, normally conversations don't end up so heated and fast paced. They can, but they don't necessarily happen that way. So I don't want to intimidate you by showing you that. I just want to show you that this material can compete kind of on a national level, if you will. It's, it's material that we've used and trained others to use, and it works. Um, let me just uh, make a, a quick comment about tactics with regards to this, and that is, Oftentimes, you'll make a case, like in this case, uh, she made a case that the unborn is different than the mother's body, and Alan Combs responds with, so you deny a woman the right to choose. Now, that didn't address what she said. Instead, he changed the subject. And so oftentimes, you'll present a scientific case, and instead of addressing your case, they'll address something else. And you want to be mindful of that and say, hold on, wait a minute, hold on a second. You need to either respond to my point with either counter evidence to show that I'm mistaken, or you need to concede my point and factor that into your assessment of the unborn. But don't just ignore what I said and move on. Okay? Tell me, did I make a case or not? If not, show me where I'm mistaken. But obviously, I'm not, no, I'm not being critical of, of, of Kathy in this instance because it's TV, but uh, you got to be aware this happens all the time in conversation. So, We've shown that there is only one question to resolve. And what's that one question? What is the unborn? And so they might say, OK, I agree with you. Then you make 
your case that the unborn is a human being. You make that case from science. Now there's a question, though, about whether all human beings are valuable. And this is where your third and final task comes in, to show that actually every human being is valuable. Now you might be saying, well, that seems a little bit odd. Well, let me explain to you how this works. Here is the moral logic of our view, the pro-life view. There's two premises. It's wrong to kill innocent human beings, and abortion kills an innocent human being. And then the conclusion is, therefore, abortion is wrong. Now, if these two premises are true, then the conclusion logically follows. And the reason is, is because this is what's called in logic a valid deductive argument. Meaning, if you show that the first two premises are true, the conclusion logically follows by necessity. And so, of those first two premises at the top, which one's the more controversial one? The second one, right. Most people will think it's wrong to kill innocent human beings. If they don't, they don't need an argument. You need to call 911. Okay, they got issues, right? If they think it's okay to just kill innocent human beings. But you're right. Most people will think that the second premise is the harder one to justify. But notice, we've just done that. We've just shown with science that the unborn is a human being. Of course, it's innocent. hasn't committed any moral crimes. And abortion kills something. So it kills an innocent human being. So therefore, our logic is valid and, and, and good. So we're, we're good here. But here's what they do to respond, to change the challenge, if you will. They say, well, you know, it's not wrong to kill innocent human beings. It's wrong to kill innocent human persons. And the unborn might be an innocent human being, but it's not a person. So therefore, abortion is not wrong. In other words, they're saying, uh, yeah, they might be human, but they're not a person. Now, this, by the way, when I was debating um, a feminist a couple years ago at Cal State San Marcos, and this was the move they made. The, the, the professor said, I agree with Mr., you know, I, they, she agreed with my science, she said, that the unborn is a human being, but we could still kill the unborn, and here's why. And she kind of basically made this type of argument. Now, if anybody tells you the unborn might be a human being but not a person, what question pops into your mind? Yeah, yeah what's the difference? Well, what's the difference between a human being and a human person? Now, keep in mind, they have to give an answer to this question because they've just made the incredible claim that there exists a group of human beings that are out there that we can kill with impunity simply because they're not persons. Really? Well, which human beings are they so we can go out and kill them? You know? Which human beings aren't persons? <clears throat> yeah, how, how do you know? Well, this, this is how they're going to answer this question. They're going to say, well, the difference between a human being and a person is, and they're going to cite a characteristic or a quality. They're going to say, well, it might be you know, consciousness, or it might be they can't feel pain, or you know, a human being uh, might be biologically human, but they, they aren't aware of their own existence, or whatever. Okay? Now, any answer they give is going to fall, or every quality or characteristic that they offer is going to fall under one of these four categories. Size or physical appearance, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency. And you can remember these four by the acronym SLED. In fact, we call this the SLED test. It's kind of a, a tactic that we use. In other words, <clears throat> I'm going to agree with them and say, yes, you're right, the unborn is different, the, the a human being who's unborn is different than a born person in all of these four ways. But none of these four ways is morally relevant. None of these four ways justifies disqualifying some human beings from personhood and including others. And let me give you some examples as to how I know that's the case. We'll go through each one. Yes, it's true the unborn is smaller than a born human being, but why does size have anything to do with how valuable somebody is or whether they're a person or not, right? I mean, Shaquille O'Neal is much larger than his wife in this example, right? I, men are generally larger than women. Does that mean that men are more valuable than women? Men don't say anything, because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's always some guys like, yeah, actually, I think, and I'm like, sir, you're not helping. And I was like, no, of course not, OK? It's totally irrelevant. I mean, is Shaquille O'Neal more valuable than Hillary Clinton? I mean, because he's bigger. <laughs> and many of you are like, yes, well, actually. No, not because, you know, it's irrelevant his size, even though he is larger than most women, okay? Because size is irrelevant. And so therefore, size, you can't disqualify the unborn simply because they're smaller, even though many people do. Okay, what about the L in the SLED test? It stands for level of development. Yes, it's true that unborn human beings are less developed 
than born human beings. But why does being more developed than another person somehow make you more of a person or make you more valuable than somebody else? It doesn't. My daughter is, uh, let's see, how old is she? <laughs> six. She just turned six. So she's six years old, okay? But she hasn't even fully developed her reproductive organs. She can't even bear a child yet. Whereas most 16 year old girls have more fully developed and can develop and carry a child. Does that mean that 16 year old girls are more of a person than my six year old daughter? No. Does it mean they're, they're more valuable than my daughter? No, of course not. They're equally valuable because they're equally human. So how developed you are does not bear on the question of what kind of being you are or whether you're a person or not. And you certainly can't disqualify people just because they're not developed as much as you are. Let's take the E in SLED, and that stands for environment. Yes, it's true. The unborn is in a different location than a born human being. But clearly where one is has no bearing on who one is. Right? I mean, if you fly up in space in a, <clears throat> in a spacesuit, that doesn't somehow change your value. If you're swimming underwater uh, in, in scuba gear, does it somehow make you less of a person? Because location is irrelevant. And if it's irrelevant, then how does the, the, the journey down the six inches of the, of the, um, of the uh, what's the term? Birth canal. Birth canal, thank you. I'm like thinking of a term like, I better not say the wrong word here, because that could be bad. Uh, down the birth canal somehow magically transform a non-valuable tissue mass into a bona fide human person who's valuable. It's irrelevant. It's just a change in location. And then finally, D stands for degree of dependency. Yes, it's true the unborn is more dependent upon its mother for survival. But why does being dependent upon somebody somehow disqualify you from being valuable? I mean, there's many people who are dependent on all sorts of medical technology to keep them alive. There's many elderly people who are dependent upon their grown children to care for them. Does that somehow disqualify their personhood? Of course not. Uh, or imagine for a moment that you were at a pool party and as everybody went inside, you were the only person to witness a one-year-old fall in the deep end of a swimming pool. Now their life is entirely dependent upon you for their survival. Could you say, well, since you depended upon me, you're not a person. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Dependency has nothing to do with it either. And so that's why all four of those areas, size, level development, environment, degree dependency, are the only four ways that the unborn differs from a born person, but none of them are relevant. None of them are justified, and none of them justify you in disqualifying the unborn from being a human person, uh, whereas including others as being human persons. And so really, to kind of give you my final thought on this issue, Abortion turns out to be a form of discrimination, and I'll point out a unjust form of discrimination. Because think about it for a moment. We have a history in our planet, Earth, of taking a class of human beings and disqualifying them from personhood in order to engage in some form of discrimination. Right? So for example, there has been discrimination against African Americans in our own country. And listen carefully, they were a class of human beings so fully, they were fully acknowledged as being human beings, but they were disqualified from being valuable based on an arbitrary characteristic. What characteristic? Their skin color. Why? So they could be enslaved. Now, we've also had discrimination against the Jews in World War II. They were also a class of human beings that was disqualified from being valuable simply based on an arbitrary characteristic. What characteristic? Their ethnicity. Why? So they can be exterminated or experimented on. And so today, the same exact thing is happening with the unborn. They are also acknowledged to be a class of human beings, but they are being disqualified from being valuable simply based on an arbitrary characteristic. What characteristic? They're too small, they're not developed enough, they're in the wrong location, or they're too dependent upon their mother for survival. Why? So some people can get their careers completed, or their education done, or whatever it might be. Okay. But ultimately, abortion turned out to be a form of discrimination. Whereas our view, the pro-life view, is a very inclusive view. And we've couched this language to be very uh, receptive in a culture that likes to be inclusive and not discriminate. But here's our view. No human being, regardless of size, level of development, environment, I'm sorry, race, gender, or place of residence, should be excluded from the community of human persons. Our view of humanity is inclusive wide open to all, especially to those who are small, vulnerable, and defenseless. 
So notice we, we couch this in inclusivistic terms because that's the way the culture likes to hear uh, us talking about these things. Before I close, I just want to make uh, draw your attention to this card. Could you please raise this card up if you were given one? And you'll notice I want you to tear apart the green card because the green card has something for you to keep. And you'll notice it's got the sled test on it on one side of the card. That is for you to keep. This is a reminder of the sled test. You can put it in your pocket, your purse, your wallet, your man bag, or whatever, whatever guys carry these days. Uh, don't be ashamed if you carry a man bag, it's okay. All right, so if you got it, this is for you to keep. If you're interested in getting what's pictured on the other card, which is solid ground, this is a hard hitting piece of apologetics training that we offer every two months. We either mail it out to you in paper form or we can email it to you in electronic digital PDF form. And every two months we cover a different apologetic topic like abortion or same-sex marriage or uh, Islam or uh, you know, is the Bible reliable or whatever, something like this. And we give you hard-hitting information. You're not going to see pictures of us at bake sales. It's not that kind of newsletter. This is training. If you want to get it, just tell us either where you live. If you want a, a paper version, give us your address. Or give us your email address if you want electronic version emailed to you. Give these cards to me or put them on my table before you leave today and I will get you signed up for that. It's free. It's so, and we don't sell your name to anybody, but include your first and last name and then either an email address or snail mail address. Uh, I will be here all day to answer questions and if, um, so, but I know we're out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.